Angeline, Zimbabwean born, I now live in Mexico. I am an artist, a writer, a podcaster, healer, and an entrepreneur. I own a sustainable glass straw business called Acure, which I started in Bali and have recently launched Lieb, a magical aura spray business I co created with my spiritual mentor and healer. I am an ex PR director and a super yacht interior manager. My life has taken me around the world and fed my hunger for travel. I have a thirst for people, communications and events, and an appreciation for beauty and excellence. This means I value excellent service and love immersing myself in stunning settings. It's no wonder I settled in Mexico. The purpose of my art and the purpose of this podcast channel is to inspire you in recognizing too that the creative source of the universe lives within you too. I hope I can influence a little spark and help you increase the power of your creativity too. We are here to create. That is why we all incarnated into our human. It is in the nature of every single one of us to create. I hope you enjoy this episode and find the value in the message. So let's get started. I'd like to share a little story of a guy I know that had big dreams back in the 80s when he was just in his late 20s. Born in Ohio to a father who was an electrical engineer and a mother who ran a restaurant. He grew up with dyslexia, he couldn't cope with his studies and he dropped out of school. After his parents' divorce, he moved to Los Angeles, California with his father. He loved daydreaming and spent most of his time in his world of imagination. He is now worth nearly four billion US dollars. It was late May 2012. My Kiwi boyfriend, Sam and I, were visiting my friends in Oceanside, just north of San Diego in California. Although winter, it was still beautifully sunny, the air crisp, the sky blue, and the Californian salty wind blowing through my hair. We decided to drive up to Los Angeles to visit Sam's friend Pete, also a Kiwi, on our way up to Santa Ynez, where we were going to see a SEAL music concert. Pete and Sam used to work together on Steven Spielberg's 86-meter luxury superyacht called Seven Seas. The head chef for Spielberg, Pete moved off the private boat to a shore-based position for Steven's Pacific Palisades mansion. When Spielberg and Kate Capshaw used the luxury yacht, Pete would fly in ahead of the couple to prepare for the upcoming trip. Pete invited Sam and me to LA for the weekend to visit him. Spielberg was at the Hamptons Villa on the East Coast, so Pete had a free weekend. Of course we obliged for a weekend in Tinseltown. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed rugby player Sam had worked for Spielberg as a yacht bosun for about a year. During this time on board, we met at the Sandbar in St. Martin that December of 2010, the 17th to be exact. We decided to head across to the West Coast and consider our options. After a debaucherous weekend in Fort Lauderdale, the crew of Seven Seas had all been drug tested. We got Sam's result while with his parents on our South African holiday during a weekend stay at the luxury bush lodge, Pinder. Sam was fired immediately and instructed to never return to the boat. Three weeks after we returned to the US after our family holiday in Africa, I also tested positive, not for a drug test, but for a human. I was pregnant, eight weeks apparently. We decided to do a little road trip we landed back in Atlanta, Georgia, and drove across the country through Tennessee, Louisiana, and back down through Florida. On our very last day in New Orleans, I went to Walgreens and bought three tests, you know, just in case. I felt something was up. I was insanely tired, moody, and my boobs hurt like a bitch and were growing exponentially. After we tested positive, we went for lunch at Liv Tyler's godmother's beautiful garden restaurant. We had no clue it was Liv's family, but met her there, and she told us Emily was her godmother. So Sam and I then decided our baby would be called Skylar Emily. After a few days back in Fort Lauderdale, I had miscarried at nine weeks. So with a lost job and lost pregnancy, we decided to go west. Why the hell not? Sam and I borrowed my friend's black Jeep Wrangler and drove up the coast that May Friday morning. The drive was breathtaking, one of my favorite road trips of all time, despite the Californian six lane traffic. 
We stopped off at Huntington Beach for breakfast, Laguna Beach for a coffee, and then finally arrived at Venice Beach in Santa Monica around noon. Pete was still at the Palisades house, closing things off for the weekend with the celebrity couple, so Sam and I wandered the streets of Santa Monica around Venice while we waited. Pete recommended we stop off at a coffee shop called Earth Cafe in Santa Monica, one of the central locations for the Californication TV series. We did just that. We sipped on espressos and killed time while I secretly wished Hank Moody would walk in and whisk me away. At around two-ish, Pete met us at the Earth Cafe. We had another espresso and then we followed him in convoy to his condo. Pete's condo in Marina del Mar was not far from Venice Beach, the main port of call in Santa Monica, surrounded by small fishing boats and yachts in a quaint marina close to the famous man-made harbour. Pete had lived there for six months, but spent most of his time at the Spielberg headquarters in Pacific Palisades. I expected a luxury condo, imagining the staff living quarters to be just as spectacular as they are on the 86 metre superyacht I had been lucky enough to view. It wasn't. My expectations had bombed. I wish I had my Polaroid camera. It was as if I had stepped back in time, way back to the early 80s, 1983 to be precise. As we walked through the corridors of the dated Caramel Beige building, I could smell old people. The sort of smell that hits you when you walk into your grandparents' home or a thrift store of dusty old clothes, copper coins, stale cigarettes and urine. I sneezed. The gardens were beautifully landscaped, hedges immaculately trimmed. I expected to see characters from Weekend at Bernie's laying around by the communal pool in Floridian floral print. I didn't. Standing behind Sam and Pete as Pete shuffled in his denim pockets, trying to find the right one from his bunch of keys, Pete opened the beige paint-chipped front door with the large brass number seven below the peeping hole. We walked in, following him, stepping back in time. Pete's condo was unique. I can't remember my grandparents' home being that vintage. It was the perfect setting for an 80s soap opera. So, Pete told us the story. Steven Spielberg rented this condo back in the 70s when Marina del Mar was the up-and-coming suburb of LA. This marina development was the place to live back then. Although way above his budget, he insisted on renting the condo and living above his means. It was here both blockbuster hits Jaws and E.T. were created. Back then, he was just another kid trying to make it big in L.A. The bachelor funky, dated cream shagpal carpet, still exhaled decades of packets of Marlboro Reds, had never been removed. Nor had the cream wallpaper, the cream rotary dial telephone, the black and white photography now sepia, the grandfather clock, or the dated dusty timeless pictures on the walls. With much nostalgia and insisting it was his good luck charm, Steve decided to buy the property from the owner with his first check, but the owner had refused. He continues to rent the condo and keeps it for his staff. There are no signs whatsoever that a millionaire is in this residence. The two-bed, two-bathroom, ground-floor condo with a marina view was decorated perfectly for the 80s, possibly ahead of its time back then. Cream fake leather sofa with matching footdress and a hexagonal glass table with kitchen chairs. The kitchen, bathrooms and living space had not been renovated for at least 30 years since Stephen had lived there himself. After Sam and I settled into the 80s set, we decided we'd head over to Venice Beach while Pete had some errands to run. We drove around for ages looking for car parking before finding one directly outside the Hotel California. The rest of that afternoon, we had the Eagles track stuck in our heads. The Muscle Beach gym zone in the park was a sight worth seeing, packed out with ridiculously buff gym junkies showing off their pecs. We did the cliche romantic stroll along the Santa Monica Pier, stopped at the Mexican restaurant Marisol for a margarita on the rocks, tacos and nachos, then on the Pacific Wheel for the obligatory selfie. Once the sun had set into the Pacific Ocean and the sky turned from orange purple to indigo violet, we headed back to Pete's to get ready for a night out in Hollywood. Sam wore his usual black vans, skinny grey jeans and a purple peg-hugging t-shirt. Sam had the most desirable body for a young guy in his late 20s. He matched the stereotypical Venice Beach prototype, young and handsome. He was the love of my life back then. 
I wore a casual blue mini dress I'd picked up in Miami with my Steve Madden wedges. My hair was blondish and hung just above my shoulders. I had a year-round tan, which accentuated my green eyes. Sam and I looked great together. However, we were a volatile couple, fueled by champagne and cocaine. Our prominent personalities clashed. We were both earth signs, both headstrong. Our nights usually started off romantically, sipping champagne flutes of Prosecco in quaint, picturesque gardens before fleeting into screeches and showers of broken glass. Kiwi Pete looked dapper in a white linen shirt tucked into skinny black jeans with a blazer thrown over his left shoulder. He looked very Hollywood. He was just a little older, perhaps late 30s. I had spent a few nights out with the boys in the Caribbean and Florida. Pete spoke about his recent engagement and planned to fly his fiance over to California to live with him in the cream condo. After a couple of glasses of Sauvignon Blanc, we jumped into Pete's company car. We drove across LA to Catch Restaurant on Melrose Avenue for our 8 p.m. booking. I was comfortably in awe, staring out my back passenger window at the necklace of streetlights draped across Tinseltown, the bustling activity on Sunset Boulevard right up to Melrose Avenue heaving with film stars and models, all those about to be. Even though it was winter, everyone wore pops of colour, mini dresses and made an effort to impress. The billboards along the strip were magnificent, lit up with gorgeous faces and electrifying energy. We jumped out at the restaurant, which Pete had been eager to try. Pete threw his keys to the catch valet as we stood in the restaurant line. We were on the guest list, and it wasn't long before a perfectly pruned brunette came over to us with her clipboard and sorted us inside. Being Spielberg's chef, Pete carries a company credit card and is encouraged to seek all the new haunts in town, try new dishes, and then go home and make them for Steve and Kate. We ordered most of the menu, drank the most delicious Californian wine from Napa Valley, and were spoiled for choice when dessert was served. By the time we finished our three-course dinner, Pete was ready to retire, much to Sam's reluctance. Sam was oiled up on the Pinot Noir and keen to see more of the bright lights of Hollywood. Pete was exhausted and looking forward to his bed, not having to wake up in the morning to serve an elaborate breakfast fit for directors. He drove us from Melrose down Sunset Boulevard and around Pacific Palisades to show us some celebrity homes. I just loved the Beverly Hills to Bel Air to the Brentwood tour. Still, Sam was not impressed and couldn't believe he was driving around LA on a Friday night looking at celebrity homes from a car and not partying on Melrose Avenue. When we got home that night after our wonderful tour around the Hollywood homes and the celebrity houses, we sat in the lounge catching up. We cracked open a delicious bottle of Pinot Noir and sat talking about our days in yachting and just catching up generally on our stories. And that's where Pete shared a lot of the stories about Spielberg and the history of that home that we were in. I sat on the cream shag pile carpet and Pete rolled us a joint. So the three of us smoked some spliff, drank some wine before Sam and I went off to the office. I anticipated a rip-roaring argument, but thankfully Sam let this one slide. We stayed in the spare room, which was young Steve's office, now converted to a bedroom through the blow-up mattress. There was something magical and mesmerizing about this experience. I was thrilled to be there and could taste the history in that room. I sneezed again. The reformed bedroom was perfectly 80s. Cream aluminium vertical blinds adorned the windows, looking out to the garden area, which overlooked the waterway that the marina boats were docked in. An old oversized wooden desk with a rusty maroon desktop pencil sharpener fitted at the edge. I wasn't sure if it still worked, although there were still pencil shavings inside that plastic pouch. A blue Corona typewriter sat on the desk, no paper. It looked old, worn, and some of the letters had rubbed away. I hit my fingers on a few keys, but the rusty letters were very slow to bounce back into position. It needed some WD-40 and a good service. An empty roller deck sat on the table. The brown and beige device had been stripped of its billion dollar cards, but the original piece still holding space. A tall grey metal filing cabinet stood in the corner. I wondered if the original E.T. and Jaws manuscripts were locked away inside. I did try and open to have a sneaky look, but it was locked and there was no key. 
The desk facing the garden and marina took up most of the room. A desk lamp fixed into place was on the right back corner of the dated scruffy desk. The desk lamp was the usual studio-style lamp one would remember from the wonder years. It had a long, skinny and perforated neck with an oversized lamp and aluminium lampshade. As Sam and I lay on the blow-up mattress giggling, the moonlight shone through the vertical blinds, casting shadows on the wall in front of us. We both stopped laughing and looked at each other in astonishment. In unison, we both yelled out, E.T., and then burst into shrieks of laughter. The moonlight had cast a shadow of the table lamp onto the wall in front of us. The shadow resembled E.T. The tall, skinny neck and oversized head of the desk lamp was the perfect depiction of a silhouette image of the extraterrestrial. I jumped up to touch the aluminium lamp and tried to move it to make sure this was where the shadow was illuminating. It could not move and the shadow of E.T. on the dusty cream wallpaper remained. Making a tinny noise, I ran my fingers down the dust-sprinkled vertical blinds to an open position and stared out in bewilderment. I felt it. I felt what Steven Spielberg had felt back in 1983. Right in front of my eyes, there stood three buildings across the water, which I later learned were the Promenade Marina City Club Apartments. Built back in the 70s, they were the highlight of Marina del Rey and the US's largest man-made harbour. I knew that this is where Spielberg got his inspiration for the 1982 blockbuster hit E.T. This was also where he was living while dating actress Amy Irvine, who played Sue in the horror movie Carrie, then 23. I picked up the rotary dial cream telephone and swished the digits around, giggling like a child. I said out loud, E.T. phone home, and Sam and I both burst into raucous laughter. We stared out the window at the marina in front of us, lit up from blue underwater lights from the boats. As Sam stared out at the water, he said to me, Do you think he got the inspiration for Jaws here too? I answered, abso fucking lutely Look at the boats, the marina. I imagine that back in the mid-70s, when this harbour was built, the development was probably heaving with tourists visiting the new marina. I pictured American tourists looking at the boats. Kodak Polaroids of mothers with permed hair, high-waisted hot pants, crop tops and wedges. Young sons with surfer-teased hair riding their fiberglass skinny red skateboards. Teenage girls with pigtails carrying their black and red cassette recorders. Fathers with moustaches and long iron straight hairstyles wearing high-waisted denim jeans with colourful floral shirts tucked in. The movie Jaws, based around the fictional tourist town of Amity Island, was released in 1975. I'd like to think this is where the inspiration was conceived anyway. I felt a sense of sepia-coloured nostalgia as I stood there in my sweatpants and tea at 3am Saturday morning of 2012. My boyfriend and I were liquored up in Steven Spielberg's creative den his very first office, where history in writing and filmmaking was made. It felt fucking surreal. We fell asleep later that morning, jaws open in bewilderment, staring out at the moonlight over the marina and glazing at the shadow of E.T. on the dusty cream wallpapered walls. That night was undoubtedly out of this world. I later learned that this was also where Close Encounters of a Third Kind was edited. This was where Steve, Richard Dreyfus, and the editing team would meet secretly to huddle around the oversized 1975 editing machine. I could picture a cool 29-year-old Steve in aviator shades, his Prince Valiant hairdo, brown suede jacket, and Levi's, climbing out of his least brown Mercedes, talking on his car phone. Spielberg said he had been wanting to make a movie about UFOs since his childhood, when he used to gaze at the stars through a homemade reflecting telescope and read copies of Galaxy magazine that his father, a science fiction addict, would leave in the bathroom. It was once said that Close Encounters, for a third kind, would do for the sky what Jaws did for the sea. Spielberg cackled at the time and said, It's strictly an entertainment film. I'm not out to educate the country or to enlighten people or make them reason any differently. But I would like them to look up in the sky a little differently and with a little more curiosity and open-mindedness. There's a saying that goes something like this. 
Aim for the stars, and if you don't make it, then at least you might land on the moon. Well, it's true. It does seem to work that way in real life too. It's essential to dream big and to aim high. I know that many people are afraid of dreaming big and setting high goals for themselves because, because they are afraid that they will fail and be disappointed in themselves. The risk is just too high for them. But the real risk is in not daring to dream big because then you're guaranteed a life of mediocrity and even failure. You'll dwell in the land of average and the average is a failing formula. It is when we enlarge our visions for ourselves that we stretch ourselves and grow and become more as a person and we reach our goals. But if we let fear rule over us, then we are sure to remain stagnant, shrivel up and die with our deepest heart's desires still within us. And then we'll never know what could have been. We'll always wonder. Never be afraid to dream big dreams, dreams that will stretch you. You never know what you can accomplish if you would just give yourself permission to start dreaming again and dream big and aim high. If you are fortunate enough to have someone in your life that you can trust enough to share your dreams and goals with, then do so. It can help to keep you motivated to keep pursuing your dream. But if all you have are dream busters, then I would encourage you to seek out a mentor that you can freely share your dream with or at least start journaling so that you have a safe space to freely talk about your dream. Journaling is also so therapeutic. The dreams that God has put into your heart are there to guide you and give you clues as to your purpose and your earth assignment. Everyone has a different vision and it is unique for each one. It has been shown to you by God himself and that is why you just cannot give up on it or let the dream busters steal it. Your dreams and goals have been put inside you to help you prosper in life. So don't give up on them and just go for it. You never know. Mr. Spielberg once said, Sometimes a story speaks to me, even if it doesn't speak to any of my collaborators or any of my partners who look at me and scratch their heads and say, gee, are you sure you want to get into that trench for a year and a half? I love people challenging me that way because it's a real test about my own convictions and whether I can be the standing man of my own life and take a stand on a subject that may not be popular, but that I would be proud to add to the body of my work. That's pretty much the litmus test that gets me to say, yeah, I'll direct that one. So be the director of your own life. Dream big. And when you think you've dreamed big, dream bigger. Because everything and anything is possible. There is no separation between us and what it is we desire the most. It's all here right now in this exact moment. The happiness, the love, the wealth, the peace, financial freedom and the health. It is here waiting for you, waiting for you to connect and align with its fullest expression. This podcast is about navigating that fullest expression, going from who it is you are right now and creating the space for who it is you wish to become. It's about giving you the inspiration, the tools, the guidance, and to sow those little seeds of awareness so that together we can expand consciousness. You are capable of anything. Every intention can manifest into your wildest dream. And I'm here to show you how that is possible. You are so loved. You are so supported. So trust in the process, intend to feel good, and that goodness will become your life. And don't forget, miracles are everywhere. So stay up to date on my most recent episodes. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you can get notified every time I post a new podcast episode. To see more of my creative work, including my art, head over to my online portfolio at musesmerkaba.com. See you next week.